Welcome to Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church this morning. Um, thank you everybody for coming on this chilly day. Um, I think we're going to have, there's going to be a deacons and a session meeting on March 8th, the second Sunday of next month. Is there any other announcements? Okay. Please stand if you are able for the opening hymn, Thy Works Not Mine, O Christ, Songbook 145. I forgot one thing. Good morning. <laughs> uh, we will now have our opening invocation from Pastor Nate. And please join with me as we open up with a word of prayer. Our Father, throughout the scripture, you call your people to wait not mainly for self-discipline, if that at all. The waiting that you call us to, Lord, is to wait upon you. In the existential chessboard of our lives, we're called to wait, which is not, strictly speaking, passive, except that we're waiting on you to act. In that sense, it is passive. But the act of waiting, Lord, is very hard and difficult because life circumstances often seem like you're absent. And so the waiting, Lord, becomes a challenge it calls forth faith, not just quiet passivity. We're called to lean into you, to trust you, to taste of you, and to be confident in you, in 
your call to us to wait. So Lord, here we are in a very strange world and we're still called to wait. And in that waiting, Lord, to anticipate your rescue and your salvation and yes, your return to this earth and where you will meet out true justice and true righteousness. So in this little hour, Lord, we, we want to have a foretaste of that blessed return. And how do we get that foretaste? Well, by your spirit, of course, who draws you near as you draw near to us. So Lord, here we are, waiting. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now for our confession of sin. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. We have died. Christ has risen. We have risen. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with its desires has been crucified with Christ, making us truly justified, we are yet encumbered with the rest of the sin. We desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin, because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. We will now have a time of silence for personal reflection and confession. His Declaration of Grace. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme. For the joy of gathering his people and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of Alleluia, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Please join with me in the call to praise. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. 
He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Now direct your attention to the screen for the psalm hymn response. We'll now hear our scripture reading from Carol and Bill Carr. Last week we saw God's covenant lawsuit against his own people and the mountains who heard Israel's promise to covenant fidelity, were called upon to testify against them. In that text, God said, You know, O man, what God requires. Here in Isaiah, we see this same thread proclaimed. True worship consists not in the ritual of worship, but rather in the people's pursuit of righteousness and justice. Boiled down, it is to reflect God's genero generosity with those whom God has put in our path. Christians may debate the means to achieve these values, but we must never set them aside. The Old Testament reading today is Isaiah 58, 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they, seek, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the, ju the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fasting that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, 
and bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall be before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. The word of the Lord. The second reading is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. Paul hones in on the heart and soul of the gospel. He calls it the word of the cross, or Jesus Christ and him crucified. And yet the wisdom of God is revealed. It goes against the grain of human philosophy, and it exceeds the signs demanded by the Jews. Interestingly, Paul has two parallels going on, wisdom and folly, and folly and power. Each false source of wisdom grimaces and rejects the cross because its victory is hidden in suffering and such suffering claims climaxes in the crucifixion of, of Jesus, the God-man. It all seems so foolish to them. Crucifixion, after all, was reserved for the worst and its social stigma had no equality, had no equal. Hear the word of the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that the faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not wisdom of the age, of this age, or the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God's decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for they had, for if they had, they would have not have crucified the Lord in glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the spirit of that person, which is in him? Who also, who also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we re receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit whom is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. The word of the Lord. The Gospel reading comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, 
so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, uh, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. And now as you're able, let's stand together and sing number 140, Faith and Truth and Life Bestowing. Lord, we pray that you will be with our speaking and in our hearing. In Christ's name, amen. Someone came up to me months ago and said, I learned a new word from you, conundrum. Didn't know what it was, so I went home and I looked up the word conundrum. And uh, if I remember correctly... Conundrum is a riddle. It's something that needs to be solved. And I have a conundrum for you, and we'll banter it around. And I had an experience of a conundrum this morning. I was looking for my beloved bride, and she was nowhere to be found. I walked in every room possible, and I am just started some medication on some... Uh, um, causes me to be absent-minded as well. Um, uh, diabetes, yes, and it, it causes a little irritability and uh, a whole host of other things, and to protect themselves legally, they say, and it can cause death. I, I just love those qualifiers. But anyway, I couldn't find her, and, and this is not the first time it's happened. Uh, we live in this long gated place with rooms and I can go this way and she'll come this way and it just seems like sometimes we don't connect and I was irritated and, and then I walked real quickly and I couldn't find her at all and I thought well maybe she went on an errand. I looked out there and I saw the car. Where was she? 
I'm in the bathroom. Uh, but, but not our bathroom. And the door was open, so I didn't think there's a bathroom down the hall. And I thought, well, she won't be in there because the kids aren't up and our bathroom door is wide open. So it didn't dawn on me that she might be in the other bathroom. I'm not trying to embarrass her or anything, but that, that was a conundrum. And I, I got frustrated because I'm irritable. And, uh, but it was solved once I heard her sweet, nice voice echoed behind a closed door. And being half deaf, I really didn't know where it was coming from, so I walked around, and then I finally heard it. Okay, so Isaiah is a book of a conundrum that needs to be solved. And Isaiah is divided up into three segments. Uh, and the first segment we've touched on, that is the... Uh, uh, the uh, Messiah, and then, and then the second segment is the servant, and the third segment is the messenger. Now those are the broad topics of identity that have their own conundrums to them. And they're hard to solve because if you've been here with any frequency, it's difficult to know who the servant is. It's difficult because the servant appears to be more than one person, even on Isaiah's lips himself, let alone hundreds of years later. But that's not the conundrum we're going to talk about. Not the identity of the servant, nor the identity of the messenger, nor the identity of the Messiah. We're going to talk about the, the conundrum of the riddle of righteousness. Righteousness. What, what, what is righteousness? And, well, in our text, right, it, 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 it's clear, the text that Carol uh, read to us in verse 1 in Isaiah chapter 58. God tells his prophet Isaiah, cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people they are righteous and altogether lovely. Are you, are you reading? Okay, just, just checking. Declare to my people their transgression. To the house of Jacob their sins. You see, the Hebrew has this parallelism and that's very, they're very fond of. They often repeat synonyms for accentuating purposes that comes at the truth from a slightly different angle. And, and here at this opening verse, God has told uh, his prophet to do three things. Cry, lift up, and declare. Now those are synonyms. But, but God's driving home a point here. To be a prophet is to declare the words of God. And Isaiah had a revelation from him. And his ministry was long. And God now says, do not hold back. Declare to them their transgression. What is righteousness? Now... In the history of the church, theology is separated by liberals and conservatives, just like politics are. Um, and well, I'm going to mostly stay out of the political realm. But in the theological realm, Alfred Harnack had come back from Germany where liberal Christianity was being put forth by a reformed fellow who kind of went way left, Schleiermacher. And he said that faith is a deep feeling of dependence. And that's probably true as far as it goes. C.S. Lewis will say prayer is nothing more than our expression of our need of God. And that's what Schleiermacher said. Faith is that deep dependence upon God. Now the problem with Schleiermacher is he divorced it from history. He divorced it from Jesus Christ walking on earth and dying for the sins of the world. 
Now, he gave some verbiage to it, but primarily, Christianity consisted of this inward, deep dependence. Schleier, uh, uh, Harnack comes back from Germany, and he writes this famous book, What is Christianity? 1901 or 2 or 3 or something like that. Now comes liberalism to the American scene. Although Harnack tweaked Schleiermacher and he said, look, uh, Christianity is to follow the ethics of Jesus. And verses in Peter that Jesus is our example and we should follow him. And the Sermon on the Mount, of course. I mean, let's just, you know, be merciful. Let's turn the other cheek. Let's, let's give to the poor. Let's, that's what Christianity is. He did the same thing Schleiermacher did, however. He severed this morality from the historical Jesus Christ. And thus came this cancer into the American church called theological liberalism. And it's still with us. It takes different shades and colors. Uh, right now, it's very vogue to say that Jesus Christ did not uh, have the wrath of God poured upon him. Our, our cup that we uh, made in celebration of the purchase of this building has on it a hymn that says, until the cross of Christ, or when the cross of Christ occurred, the wrath of God was satisfied. That's a modern hymn by two people that are still alive. And the PCUSA, the church that you came out of, asked them if they could put that hymn in their new hymnal. But they wanted to change this whole wrath thing. And why is that? Well, that's because the wrath thing is an abusive, uh, archaic thing from the days of blood sacrifices. And we've come way beyond that. So we want to change this hymn of yours. And they, in good integrity, said, no, you may not. Now, it was an act of integrity to inquire, but it was also a greater integrity to deny them their request. So Christianity in mainline denominations stuck out in conservative USA, the reddest of all red states, supposedly, they're filled with mainline denominational preachers who don't really think that Jesus bore the wrath of God for your sin. Because that's abusive and it's going back to blood sacrifices of these pagans. We want nothing to do with it. All right. So, liberals are often touting the ethics of Jesus. And you can affirm as far as it goes, if they're accurate. However, uh, Christianity is not reduced to a deep dependence, and Christianity cannot be reduced to the ethics of Jesus. That's not historic Christianity. The church is under a fight for her life right now. All right. So, unfortunately, when someone gets to uh, set the debate with the language that they get to choose, that limits the, pers the people who would like to dialogue and challenge that. And so, conservative churches reacted to this emphasis on the ethics of Jesus and said, that's liberalism. And so the American conservative church focused on correct doctrine concerning and relating to the death life of Jesus Christ. And we de-emphasized the ethics of Jesus. All right. This is a quick glance here, but in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20, that I had read to you, uh, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is a hotly debated verse amongst conservatives. 
Because what is that righteousness? I mean, is he just asking us to be more right on a behavioral level than the Pharisees and the scribes, or we won't enter the kingdom of heaven? Or is the righteousness being referred to here what Herb continues to preach and teach correctly uh, that this is a forensic righteousness that Jesus is alluding to? Because our righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so Jesus takes it out of the realm of our morality and he's pointing to his work on the cross. Now some, many conservatives, go down that road, particularly Lutherans. Because they're really big on justification by faith alone. But it's in our tradition as well. But I think that's a... Not the correct way to go in Matthew 5, chapter 20. Jesus is really saying, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that's a descriptive reality of a person who's truly united with Jesus Christ. But I don't think Jesus is talking about forensic righteousness here. But you need not fear that heaven, therefore, is merited by you. Jesus is descriptively describing those who truly know Jesus Christ will have a level of righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes. That's how I think this verse ought to be interpreted. Now, I don't give you God's interpretation. I give you my best ability to decipher this. Okay, now back to the riddle in Isaiah. That's all we're going to do with Matthew 5. Interestingly, chapters 1 through 39 have righteousness and justice paralleled. Now just stay with me here. Chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah parallel, when they speak of righteousness, it speaks of justice. Chapters 40 through 54, I believe, they don't have that parallel at all. The righteousness in chapters 1 through 39 is a righteousness that God demands of his people. It's the righteousness that the Pharisees and the scribes lacked. And God's righteous declaration, God's righteous command to Israel in chapters 1 through 39 is connected with justice. It's connected with doing right. Now the problem, of course, with God's people is the very opening of Isaiah. You don't need to turn to it. I just want you to stay focused with me here. And this relates to our verse, chapter 1, verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Verse 13, I cannot endure your iniquity, the solemn assembly. My soul hates it. You've come to me with a, and you burden me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. I will not listen. You see, now this is God confronting his people with a lack of righteousness, a lack of righteousness from them. And indeed, they have nothing to offer but seeming iniquity and rebellion and religious form and ceremony. In verse 16, God commands them, Wash yourselves, remove the evil, cease to, e to, to do evil. Verse 17, chapter 1 of Isaiah, Learn to do good, seek justice, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. 
That's the righteousness that Jesus says in Matthew 5, you must exceed because they aren't doing what God wanted them to do. But now in chapter 40 of Isaiah, that parallel of justice and righteousness doesn't exist. And I told you before that Isaiah is divided up into three sections, chapters 1 through 39, 40 through 55, uh, and then 56 through 66. So in the first section, justice and righteousness. In the second section, it's gone. And what is in place of justice, righteousness appears, but it's paralleled not with justice, but with salvation. Okay? Now you have to note that. If you're going to try to understand this whole book, there's this glaring yellow flashing lights that says justice and righteousness are what God requires of us, and then that disappears in the midsection of Isaiah, and it's replaced with righteousness and salvation. And then what do you think happens in chapters 55 and 66? That's the solve. That is the answer and the solving of the riddle. Human righteousness, God's claims. Righteousness and salvation. Is that righteousness paralleled with salvation, the same righteousness that is paralleled with justice? And I would argue not. This righteousness that's in the middle section of Isaiah has to do with salvation. It's a gift. It's that which God's people need and which will save them from their inability. When God says in chapter 2 of Isaiah, your iniquity is from the tops of your head to the bottom of your feet. The answer to Israel's inability to act and behave righteously is that they don't have a heart to fear and love and delight in God. Something needs to happen. God needs to send his gift. God needs to send salvation so that these people with stony hearts can have hearts of flesh and delight and want to serve God and not use religious form and tradition to hide upon. Man, the arrogance of God's people was unbelievable. Look in Isaiah there. Verse 3, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? That's their question to God, apparently. And God responds, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You see, a heart that just is absolutely not responding to God as he is, but rather they, they use even his commands and his religious structure in the temple worship as a hiding, as a way of distancing themselves from the presence of God. That is really wild. And I think we're capable of doing that. Indeed, I think, as Calvin says, our hearts are like idolatry factories. I think we're just on a sliding continuum because sin still is within us and, and we are confronted with hiding from God and hiding under all kinds of things to keep his glaring presence from coming down upon us because our conscience doesn't like it. It's a matter of running water. Water will find the course of least resistance. A sinful heart will find a course of least resistance. It will avoid God and construct and fabricate all kinds of things to keep him away. And one of those things that God's people did throughout the ages is the very form of worship that they engaged in in the temple. Now that should scare the hell out of you. Literally. And it should drive us to our knees. 
God, I'm still divided. I'm, I, I'm still just all screwed up and I, I don't even know my own self. And we should pray as David prayed. Lord, forgive me of my sins and forgive me of my secret faults. Sin is too pervasive still. Our hearts are not whole yet. And so we need to be mindful of its propensity. Now some people hide behind all kinds of things. I don't drink or play cards or smoke cigars or hang around women who do. Some of you were more offended or spent more time. He, did he really say hell from the pulpit? And you kind of lost my whole track of thought. You see, we are sinful, broken people, are we not? So, interesting. In chapter 56 now, the third section of Isaiah, here's something very interesting that happens. You don't have it in your, you can write it down if you like. Chapter 56 of Isaiah, verse 1. Interestingly, justice and righteousness from the first section of Isaiah, which last appeared in Isaiah chapter 33, comes back for the first time in Isaiah chapter 56. I just want to say that again, uh, just so you, so you get that. This parallel between righteousness and justice disappears in chapter 33, is absent in the midsection of Isaiah from 40 to 55, and then reappears in chapter 56, verse 1. So it's absent for all that middle of Isaiah and now it comes back in chapter 56 verse 1 of Isaiah. And we have to ask, why? Why were these two words paralleled in the beginning of Isaiah, absent in the middle of Isaiah, and reappear at the final section of Isaiah in its opening chapter, in its opening verse? Now the liberals will tell you that this is just proves that there's multiple authors and it's just a confusing mess. But a Bible-believing person will understand that the solution to that riddle is the midsection of Isaiah where righteousness and salvation are paralleled. Because the answer to the hardness of the heart of Israel in the opening section of Isaiah is given a solution in the middle of Isaiah and now we can begin talking again about righteousness and justice because salvation comes, breaks stony hearts, regenerates God's people and it changes the whole orientation of a human being. Now, the, second, the third section of Isaiah is not the second return of Christ. We're still waiting for that. And so, what's interesting in the third section of Isaiah is more condemnation and attack on Israel's sin. Because they have not yet received the substance of the promise to Abraham which comes in the New Covenant, which is the regeneration of the human heart. So, not only does justice and righteousness reappear in chapter 56, but God's attack on their sinfulness appears. But they've got enough information now to know how to wait what to do in this moral outcry of God from the lips of his prophet. Now they know that the answer is God's salvation. Now they know that God must send the Messiah. Now they know that their righteous demands of God are simply impossible in their present state. They need God. They need the gift of righteousness. They need salvation. And then that salvation comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Look at the rhetoricalness in our verses, chapter 58 there of Isaiah, verses 5, 6, and 7. God is talking to them. 
Is such a fast that I choose? Is it to bow down? Verse 6, is not this the fast that I've chosen? See, now there's, there's, a, there's a contrast here. Their fast, as we saw earlier in Isaiah, is a fast of their own pleasure. In verse 3, you seek your own pleasure in your religious worship. And then he says in verse 5, is such a fast the fast that I've chosen? Verse 6 answers that question. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bounds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? But you see, the liberals own this stuff, so we don't look at it. But the liberals don't own this. This is God's call to us. We're to find the broken and the bruised. Jesus directs us to the highways and byways. And I ask myself, I'm beginning to know some people in Torrington. My Facebook members are growing. And I, you know, and I'm hoping that some will come here and come there and our church will grow and so on. But I wonder how many people I know south of the tracks. You know, that's a phrase we can use in Torrington, isn't it? Because we have tracks. I think I know one family south of the tracks. And that's because my son, it's his friend. So I ask you, do we want people like ourselves and grow and be successful? What are we doing here? What am I doing here? trying to tickle the ears of some so that we get our share of the pie and we grow and I have a job and is that what I'm doing here? I hope not. So God's call to righteousness is there. I mean, we could open it up, but we don't have time. But in one sense, the surfaced meaning just stares at us. And I have to challenge myself with my question. I'm not saying that's your question. But I have to challenge myself. I I really don't know people south of the track. And besides, they wouldn't put much on the plate anyway. Oh, I can't say that. I can't think that. I didn't think that, did I? Maybe I did. I don't know what challenge you have for yourself to find the lost and the broken. I don't know what questions you need to ask to find these broken people in need and what you're doing with your hands in your pocket and your feet on the ground. I have my questions, but you need to have yours. And we need to pray for each other. And the answer, brothers and sisters, is in the righteousness of his salvation through his Son, Jesus Christ, in which I'm declared innocent, in which my sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. They do not haunt me because they are no more. And that frees me. You see, that frees me. I don't need to hide behind this religiosity and this stolen Episcopal robe that I have. I can actually tell you I stole it. With a kind of smirk on my face, he knows I have it. You see, we need to pray. We need to pray that we're going to be more righteous than the Pharisees who hid behind their religiosity. Now, all of that sounds terribly hard and challenging, and it's meant to be. Because God told Isaiah, cry out loud, lift up your voice, declare it to my people. Don't hold back. And I'm not holding back. But I'm in a new covenant context. And I don't want to take away what I just gave you in a challenge. But I've seen love here. I've seen it overflow from your cups of life with your hands in your pockets and your feet on the ground. And that's what we need to continue to do and ask how we can do it more. How we can be more of a beacon here. 
I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to condemn us all. I heard over Presbytery, this guy shared a phrase from his philo- uh, theology professor. He said, I'm going to give you two phrases, one one day and one the other. The first day was this. Why are you so discouraged? I mean, you're a lot worse off than you really think you are. And I had to stop and I went, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, what did you just say? Yeah, why are you so discouraged? Why are you so downtrodden? You're a lot worse than you think you are. And if you're, and I think the lesson there is if you're discouraged now, you won't even be able to swallow your real state. And then the next day he came. And he said this. You barely have a clue how much God loves you. Barely have a clue how much he wants you. How much as his bride he seeks you. How much as his bride he seeks to be one with you and enjoy this life that he has given us. So hold those two things together because they're both true. Let us not be downtrodden and discouraged. We're a lot worse off than what we think we are. But we have a message. The middle of Isaiah shouts the salvation of God. And the world, if we barely know it, the world doesn't know how much God truly loves them. You know, maybe your challenge needs to be this. I found it the other day. I was sitting here this morning preparing for this whole thing. Uh, this isn't it. Putting in these, these great book markers. And I can turn here without thumbing through and I can turn here and then I looked at it. How many of these have I given away? How hard is that? I go to a restaurant and if I'm scared to death of people, I can at least leave it on the table. Do you believe you have the salvation message from God? I think that's a challenge we could all use. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let's stand and confess as alive Christians the content of our faith found in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father for all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Again, glory to the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end, And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, and we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. And now, of course, we have the opportunity to draw near to God in prayer with our praises, our thanksgivings, our requests, our concerns.
I will open us up in prayer and I will also lead us in praying the Lord's Prayer when there's sufficient silence. So let us come before God. Heavenly Father, this thing called life, however short it is, is just filled with tension. There's a tension of my own unbelief and the tension of your call to be holy. And it just, they collide. And so, Lord, thank you for rescuing this lost poor soul. And these lost poor souls that are before me, Lord. We don't know how bad we truly are. And yet, Lord, we have just begun to go down the road of how much you love and care for us. Just barely have begun that journey. But, Lord, one thing we know. In the past, you told your stone-hearted people that you will not hear them. But you tell your new covenant people that you have heard them. And now, Lord, as we express our concerns and our requests, be merciful on them, Lord, and hear us in Jesus' name. to listen to you and to obey you and to go and, and do. And we ask, Lord, that you guide us and, and, and send us. I also like to lift up Mrs. Riley, Adele's mother, and that she is ill and seeking uh, medical advice at Mayo's. Let's be with that family, Lord. Amen. Saw the family. Yes, Lord. Lord, I pray that in this community, in this state, in this nation, that you will move in such a way, move in a way that only you can do, to instill in people a hunger for you and for your word. I sense a lack of satisfaction with the world and all the things that it gives and, and a lack of desire for you and your work. I sense that you've withdrawn to a large degree in this local community, in this state, in this community. There's just not much hunger for you or your work. I pray that I'm wrong about that and that the problem is in our presentation, but I question that, Lord. I, I seek your guidance in how to reach out to this community. We're doing what we can. We have a pastor who is creative and has tried many things and continues to try things. I sense a lack of desire for you and for your word amongst the people of this community. I think they want a surface level involvement at, at some point but not a deep involvement. Um, and Lord, I know what your word teaches. Only you can change hearts. Only you can put the desire in there. Only you can draw people to Christ. We can't do that. And so I humbly ask you and I beseech you, Lord, create that hunger in them. Draw them near us. Show us what to do uh, regarding that, Lord. Amen. And now would you join with me in praying the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. From whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God's salvation is His nearness. And our form of worship presupposes His nearness because of what Christ has done. So the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary. Evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. God's continued promised presence, and he invites his people to come. And by coming, they do many things. They proclaim the Lord's death by coming here publicly. For those who can see, you do say that Christ has come, that Christ has been put to death, that Christ has been raised. You proclaim that, and all that that means by coming to this table. You also proclaim and celebrate and look to a past event in history on a cross. So you look backwards when you come to this table. You also, when you come to this table, look forward. Because this is God's promised presence and his return. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So we come to this table in hopes and in anticipation and a joyous waiting, almost in holy irritability, that Christ returns. And so that's what you also do at this table. Now, if that's your heart, if you look back in the past, if you look at his pre present presence, and you also look at his promised coming presence, then this table is for you. And he wants to speak to you. He wants to give himself to you. In the words of the Psalms of Solomon, he wants to bring the king's kiss to you, to strengthen you. When he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing, and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Past, present, and future. God desires to speak. Come when you are ready.
The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 The blood of Christ current shed for you. Darling, the blood of Christ shed for you. Thank you, Pastor. Becky, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen, brother. Amen. Carolyn, the blood of Christ shed for you. Carrie, the blood of Christ shed for you. Tammy, the blood of Christ shed for you. Kat, the blood of Christ shed for you. Grace, the blood of Christ shed for you. Lee, the blood of Christ shed for you. Hear the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Welcome back. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Augusta, the blood of Christ shed for you. Gracie, the blood of Christ shed for you. Susan, the blood of Christ shed for you. Katie, the blood of Christ shed for you. Linda, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. Well, this message was difficult, but I can't wait till next week. I've got to increase my dose three times, and it causes irritability. So look out. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so, brothers and sisters, in Christ, what shall we say? What shall we do? Are we going to hide behind forensic righteousness and distance ourselves because the liberals own the ethics of Jesus? I hope not. Well, it's difficult. I know it is. I know. Application is always difficult. And so, how do we get to where we're supposed to be? And I think we have to look at the center of Isaiah and receive his salvation. And that will enable us to go down the path. So brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. The Lord keep you and protect you. And may his face shine upon you and be glorious to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.